The Brawler. For a brief period in the late 80s, early 90s, the side-scrolling brawler captured the imagination and quarters of gamers everywhere. That feeling of standing shoulder to shoulder around an arcade cabinet taking down waves of enemies as you work your way to the end, it was a wonderful time. But it was Sega's home efforts, perhaps, that succeeded above all. Streets of Rage, or Bare Knuckle as it was known in Japan, was released as Sega's answer to the popular Final Fight. A brawler set within an urban, crime-soaked underworld that has players punching their way through the game set to a pumping dance soundtrack. It's a legendary example of 16-bit gaming. And now, 26 years later, Streets of Rage has re-emerged. And it just happens that this might be one of the finest brawlers ever made. This is the sequel I've been waiting for. And while those initial trailers may have left some concerned, the final game is a masterpiece. But how did we get here, and what makes a game like this good in the first place? That's what we're here to find out. On today's episode, we're going to kick things off with an exploration of the original Streets of Rage trilogy. Then we're going deep with Streets of Rage 4 to not only discuss its design and technology, but also look at the tools used to build the game. All that and much more is coming up on this episode of Digital Foundry. The golden age of brawlers, a brief moment in gaming history ignited by the release of games such as Double Dragon. Its success triggered a flood of side-scrolling beat-em-ups from prolific publishers around the world. This includes the release of Final Fight from Capcom. With huge sprites and crisp action, Final Fight helped define what a brawler could be, and its release on Super Famicom in late 1990 served as a powerful opening salvo in the 16-bit console wars. Now, Sega already had side-scrolling beat-em-ups on its console, such as Golden Axe, but it needed something darker, something more urban. It needed a final fight killer. Enter Bare Knuckle, aka Streets of Rage. Released just six months after the Super Famicom conversion of Final Fight, Streets of Rage boasted two-player simultaneous action with a killer soundtrack and atmosphere to spare. And this was followed up with two amazing sequels that helped cement the series' place in history. But before we dive into each game, I want to stand back and examine what it is that makes these games work in the first place. To do this, we need to consider the three pillars of brawler design, as I call them. The three central elements that define great games in the genre. First, there's the impact, the feeling of connecting your attack with a foe. A great brawler features instant button response coupled with carefully crafted frames of animation and a proper stutter, the shaking when an enemy takes a hit. It's a delicate balance of collision detection, animation, and camera movement. The base attack is an action you will be performing over and over again, so if it doesn't feel just right, the game will fall flat. Then there's the music. This may seem to occupy space outside of core gameplay, but in reality, it's central to the experience. The music sets the tone and pace of the action, building excitement around your actions as you play. Without a great soundtrack, the experience is dramatically lessened. And lastly, we have the visuals. Brawlers are inherently repetitive, but the quality of the sprites, background, and animation help create something memorable. This all ties back into the overall feel of the game. Now, of course, there's more to this, but if these key objectives are not reached, the game will suffer. Now, the original Streets of Rage gets much of this right, but it still feels like an early effort. The sprites are small, the frame rate is only 30 frames per second, which is uncommon on the platform, and the moveset is somewhat limited. But the key elements are here. The impact of each punch is satisfying. It feels good to unleash your fists on each foe. The stellar soundtrack forms the foundation on which the game's pace is constructed. There was nothing on home consoles that sounded quite like this. Clean PCM samples and a capable sound driver work in tandem to deliver clean, crisp percussion. This original soundtrack is the work of the legendary Yuzo Koshiro, who would work in some capacity on all of the follow-ups. 
The original Streets of Rage also features gorgeous pixel art background work that is highly evocative. The city at night is a beautiful place full of dancing neon lights and huge cityscapes. Sega even produced a version of Streets of Rage for the Master System and Game Gear. The 8-bit version is interesting in that it does target 60 frames per second, unlike the Genesis original, but the limitations of the hardware become a real issue here. Battles are limited to very few characters per screen, sprite flicker is a constant problem, and collision detection is laughably poor. Most battles devolve into knocking one enemy off the screen while another walks up from behind, where you then repeat the process. So while it looks nice and sounds great, it completely misses the first and most critical pillar of brawler design. The basic attack simply doesn't feel good to use. Still, between this and the original Sega Genesis version, Streets of Rage was a huge success for Sega. It was the beginning of a key franchise. So it should come as no surprise then that it was quickly followed up with a sequel. Streets of Rage 2 arrived a year and a half later, standing as perhaps one of the greatest sequels of all time. It's a game which improves upon every element in the original game. Larger sprites, more animation, more enemies, larger stages, more moves, and an even better soundtrack. It's the complete package. The first pillar is a lock then. The basic actions in Streets of Rage 2 feel perfect. The new sprites are more detailed and better proportioned, and each frame of animation is spot on. It simply feels great to perform this basic punch. But the game goes further. Streets of Rage 2 adds a new layer of depth with additional moves now available to the player. This includes a special move executed by double tapping forward as you attack. With Axel, this unleashes the legendary Grand Upper, but each character has their own style. The special move executed by using the A button by default was also overhauled. In the original game, pressing this would trigger a police vehicle that would roll in and rain down fire upon your foes. It's pretty cool, but it's not well integrated into the combo system. With Streets of Rage 2, instead you execute one of two punches, which are more powerful but drain a small chunk of life with each use. The overall flow to the game is just greatly improved, with more variation in level design and stages that move more than just left to right. It's a smarter, tighter game all around. The second pillar of quality then is also reached with ease. The soundtrack stands as one of the best on the system, with additional variety and super high quality beats. It really demonstrates what's possible with Sega's 16-bit hardware in the right hands. Lastly, there's the presentation, which is perhaps the greatest improvement of all. Sprites are much larger and more detailed this time. The frame rate was increased to 60 frames per second, there are more layers of parallax scrolling, and backgrounds are much more complex. It's a game that demonstrates an expert use of color to produce a gritty yet beautiful world. Like the original, it received a Master System conversion as well, which this time fares much better. It still exhibits many of the limitations of the original, but the collision detection has been dramatically improved, and the game just feels faster and more fluid to play. Well, at least overall, one of the sacrifices made to reduce sprite flicker was to reduce the overall frame rate to 30 frames per second. The enemy AI is also a huge step down from the Genesis version, but hey. So Streets of Rage 2 set the standard for what a brawler could be then. The enemy placement and attack patterns are more fair, while the game rewards skilled play. It's simply not designed to eat your quarters like many other comparable brawlers of the era. It's one of the best 16-bit beat-em-ups ever made. Now, in 1994, the series received a third installment, with Streets of Rage 3. At its core, the third game builds upon the second with satisfying combat, gorgeous visual design, and even more variety in its level layouts but there are some unexpected issues as well. Now, the first pillar is easily met. Every punch feels just as good as it did in Streets of Rage 2. The playability is fantastic here. Unfortunately, Streets of Rage 3 is notorious for localization changes made when bringing the game to the West. 
This includes changing the sprite colors, censoring certain enemies and characters, and cranking up the difficulty among other things. The western version is simply less enjoyable to play overall and as a result I have a strong preference for Bare Knuckle 3. The soundtrack is another controversial element, one which perhaps places the second pillar on shaky ground. There are some amazing tracks in the game like this, but others that seemingly fall short, sounding more chaotic. Yet there is method to the madness. According to Yuzo Koshiro, who along with Motohiro Kawashima composed for the game, Streets of Rage 3 made use of software which enabled randomly generated numbers in each register of a frequency modulation oscillator. This allows for unique sound generation used during track creation. And it's rather experimental, but clearly not to everyone's taste. I can, however, respect what they have achieved. Still, despite the shift in music and censorship in the West, what's left is a very enjoyable brawler. In fact, in some ways, it's the best of the three. The special system, for instance, was rethought out. When the meter reaches OK, for instance, you can unleash a powerful attack without losing any health. If you use it again before that meter fills back up, though, you lose health just like the second game. Beyond this, every character can now run and dodge, kind of like Skate from the second game, using a double tap motion on the D-pad. It's just really great stuff all around. Looking at all three games, though, I feel the series as a whole really holds up while also showing some interesting progression. Each game evolved certain elements of the gameplay while improving the presentation. There's a reason why the series is looked back upon so fondly. But of course, this would be the final Streets of Rage game for quite some time. There were rumors of a Streets of Rage 4 in development for Dreamcast, of course. This concept footage gives us a better idea of what they were potentially attempting to achieve. If it had been made though, it would have definitely been in 3D just like this or something like Spike Out, which I'm not sure is the best fit for this series. Either way, this fourth game never materialized. That is until mid-2018, when this new trailer hit the internet. This is Streets of Rage 4. Developed as a collaboration between .emu, Guard Crush Games, and Lizard Cube, who previously worked on Wonder Boy the Dragon's Trap remake, Streets of Rage 4 is designed as a direct follow-up to the original trilogy. In creating the game, the team wanted to retain that which makes the series special while expanding in areas that made sense. The idea was to build a 2D brawler that relies on hand-drawn animation with a level of fluidity on par with something like, say, Street Fighter 3. This means bespoke frames rather than tweened, flash-like animation. So while the style does break away from the pixel art design of the original games, it still relies on traditional keyframes carefully designed to communicate each action, and I think it looks great. But it has changed since that original trailer, which was lacking the ambience layer and other lighting effects leading to overly bright character sprites. In the final game, characters blend much more naturally with the background artwork, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now once you pick up a controller, it's immediately evident that the core combat loop is perfectly crafted. In that sense, the game delivers on the first pillar of brawler design by ensuring that your basic actions are extremely satisfying to use. The development team spent time studying the original games frame by frame to ensure that every hit, stutter, and shake perfectly replicates the original games, and then some. What I love about the design is how much is done with these core mechanics. The combo system, for instance, is now much more nuanced, allowing for deeper combat without sacrificing accessibility. The new special system takes a page from Bloodborne in that triggering a special utilizes a small amount of life, but if you manage to land additional hits after using it, you'll fill that chunk of life back up. Take a hit though, and you lose it. There's also star attacks, which are actually collectible, similar to the special in the original Streets of Rage. And these simply execute an even more powerful move. 
I especially love the way the levels evolve to include different types of foes with unique AI behavior and skills. The dojo battle in Chinatown, for instance, simply adds more weapons to the mix while introducing more and more enemies over time in a rather cinematic fashion. It's done in such a way that by the end it feels as if you fought through a Hong Kong action movie. So yeah, it's great stuff, but I was also curious. How does one go about building a game like this in the modern era? And what is it about Streets of Rage 4 that feels so authentic? Well, I had a chance to speak with members of the development team, learning a lot about how the game was created in the process. For starters, Streets of Rage 4 was created using the in-house developed Guard Crush engine, which allows for smooth 60 frames per second 2D action across multiple platforms. The game is designed with a target of 1080p, but really, as with games like Cuphead, the output resolution has little impact on what you see. The artwork is crisp and clean across all platforms. Of course, the central focus of any brawler will always be the characters, and this is the character editor that was used to design them. From collision boundaries to move timing and more, everything can be adjusted here by hand. The artists provide the necessary keyframes and the designer can then insert each frame where needed while adjusting how everything works within the game. But more interesting than that is the AI debug view. Look closely, notice the lines, circles, and text around the various characters. This is used to indicate the actions being performed by the AI at any one point, and the AI is a huge part of a brawler. In fact, I think this is one of the key secrets behind Streets of Rage. The way enemies circle around the player and the timing of their attacks, it's all designed to be tough but fair. The team studied this behavior very closely and worked to implement a similar system in the new game. Every type of enemy has their own unique behaviors and they're constantly working out how to attack in real time around the player. In other brawlers, such as Final Fight, behavior was never quite as refined. Enemies just sort of move in a straight line directly towards the player, rather than actively circling and moving around the arena. And if you look at the panel over here on the right, you can see the values adjusted in real time for this specific enemy. All these variables defined possible actions. This combination of carefully designed AI, hitboxes, and animation is so central to the overall feel of Streets of Rage 4. Tweaking these values to ensure maximum playability is one of the reasons why it plays as well as it does. Now all of the action you see then is framed within this 16x9 bounding box, which scrolls along the playfield as you move your character. This view also showcases the different areas and zones in which the player can walk. Hopefully by this point you're starting to get an idea of how everything was pieced together in terms of basic actions, enemy reactions, and movement. But what about the visual component of the stages? The beautiful 2D hand animated backgrounds. While each level is built from a large chunk of art data carefully placed alongside different parallax layers that are all defined to move independently. The play area is drawn using a fixed perspective of course, designed to add depth like the original games but the character sprites move two-dimensionally. There is no scaling in and out as you move towards the screen. When playing the game, the short loading screen shows your progression, and during the screen, all required art data is fetched and prepared for use. With everything loaded, the game requires roughly two gigabytes of memory, though the PC version has the option to use uncompressed art data, which should increase that slightly. The level art itself then is pieced together in the editor to create these long, seamless strips, rather than relying on, say, a tiling system with reused chunks. During actual gameplay, however, a culling system is used around the viewing window, only drawing artwork as needed. In that sense, it works like many other modern games. But this is just the background layer by itself. To enhance this, they've also implemented something known as the ambient layer, and this includes features such as lights, shadows, reflections, and more. And this is one of my favorite elements. The spheres visible in this area here within the editor represent objects of light. Each light is dynamic, and a unique system was created to allow the lights to play off the sprites, creating the illusion of rim lighting. Look at the character as he moves in and out of the lit area. This also extends to things such as the plumes of smoke emanating from the sewers in this stage. Note how it's properly lit by the sign. Cool, right? Characters also receive appropriate shading depending on the environment they're in. 
Though I should note there is an option to reduce the ambient level, which produces brighter characters more similar to that original trailer. Personally, I prefer leaving this at 100% as it better grounds the characters within the environments. Textures can also be projected onto characters such as these stained glass windows, which really give the impression of projected light falling across 2D objects. Then there are the reflections. Everything from marble flooring to puddles of water properly reflect all the surroundings, including characters. It's a dramatic effect that adds a lot to the visual presentation. So how does it work? First you have your primary rendering pass, rendered back to front. This is then repeated a second time and flipped. This render target then serves as the reflection which is made semi-transparent, filtered and manipulated to simulate natural distortions. But the line of reflection is important. These reflections require careful placement. When the elevation of a stage changes, for instance, such as these steps in stage one, the art needs to be placed in such a way that at the midpoint of these steps, no reflective art is used as the line of reflection has changed. Once you climb those stairs, it can be realigned properly. There's a lot of hand placement of this technique to ensure that it looks correct in each scene. The last piece of the ambient layer puzzle then are the shadows, which are utilized to further anchor objects within the world. These shadows are designed to simulate contact hardening, appearing sharper at the point of origin and becoming more diffuse as it moves away from this point. And when you combine all these elements together, it becomes clear that there's a lot more going on than you might first anticipate and it helps create a rather striking 2D experience. I feel it works extremely well, it's a very attractive game. The animation is so fluid and the amount of detail poured into every scene is really impressive. It's also neat to see how the game has evolved over time. Cyril from Guard Crush Games was kind enough to share early footage of the game still in development, from sections with incomplete backgrounds that are just pencil sketches still, to various other test scenes, you really get a good idea of how the game has evolved since starting development. It manages to look rather nice even in this early state. I really like the pencil drawn backgrounds. It would have been neat to see this as an option in fact, but it wouldn't have been simple to implement I'd imagine. But I'm more than happy with the final visuals. But if you want to tweak these visuals, there are some additional options to mess with in the options menu, including these two pixel modes. The first pixelizes the entire image and then shifts the camera ever so slightly in order to line up the pixels with an even grid pattern. It's an interesting look. Then there's the CRT filter which takes the same approach and applies blurring and a scanline filter on top of it. It looks okay, but it's not my favorite take in the concept. Personally, I prefer the default visuals. There are numerous other options available as well on console which you can disable, but these appear to exist purely for aesthetic reasons and have zero impact on the frame rate. Speaking of which, prior to release, I have had access to the PlayStation 4 and PC versions of the game. For Switch and Xbox One, I'll be sure to give these a shot when I get my hands on them, and I should have updates on my Twitter regarding performance for those concerned. Now on PS4 and PS4 Pro, the frame rate is basically perfect, but ultimately unexciting from an analysis point of view. Fundamentally, the game runs at 60 frames per second without any hiccups or dips. It is completely stable. I've run quickly through this stage to demonstrate just how stable the frame rate really is, and you can see that it really never drops. Now the PC version has some additional options to disable, but the requirements seem rather low as a whole. If you do disable all the various effects though, it does have a noticeable impact on the overall appearance. As for the low latency over performance option, this basically starts sending commands to the GPU earlier in the rendering chain and it basically shaves one frame or 16 milliseconds off input latency. So when it comes to presentation, the game is top notch. The third pillar I mentioned earlier, the visuals, has been fully realized and I feel they nailed the style perfectly. And this comes from someone that was skeptical when the game was first revealed. I wasn't a huge fan of that initial trailer, but after playing it for myself, I feel the developers made the right choice. As for that second pillar though that we skipped over, the music, Streets of Rage 4 delivers as well. The main composer on the project is Olivier de Riviere, who delivers an exceptional set of tracks, but additional composers were brought in as well to score various other tracks, including the killer combination of Yuzo Koshiro and Motohiro Kawashima, a pair of composers that had worked on Hotline Miami, and other exceptional composers from game music history. 
With this many people working on the game, it's amazing how well it all gels together. From the introduction track that perfectly captures that Streets of Rage vibe. This sick boss music played at the end of the first stage. And beyond, the soundtrack is just perfect in my book. Rather than leaning heavily on something like Synthwave to bring that retro vibe to the forefront, the music instead feels like this interesting fusion of different genres into one coherent whole. It's both retro and modern, but it works. So, Streets of Rage 4 nails the three pillars of the brawler. And in terms of gameplay execution, I feel it stands tall next to the original three games, and in fact, might just be superior overall. It really is that good. Which is why I place this heartily alongside the likes of Sonic Mania, Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom, and Mega Man 11 as a perfect realization of a classic concept within a new game. The developers clearly understand Streets of Rage and have delivered a brawler that stacks up beautifully against the best in the genre. This is easily one of my favorite games of the year and an already packed year. It's a must play. But that's going to do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this brief tour through the history of Streets of Rage and the in-depth look at Streets of Rage 4. If you did enjoy it, as always, be sure to give us a like and subscribe, ring the notification bell for instant updates on Digital Foundry, and of course, come find us over on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.